open your Bibles to John chapter 3. If you don't have a copy of the scripture with you, there are plenty of them available around this room. They're the black, uh, the black book that's in the pews. And uh, if there isn't one available to you, just look around like you're looking for a Bible. Or grab the one in the hands of the person next to you and let them get their own as well. And no one will mind if you do that. We're in John chapter 3 this morning. Uh, let me give you guys some tips for next year's chili cook-off, since that's on my mind a little bit. There are a lot of strategies, did you notice last night, to winning the chili cook-off? Uh, one, you could just make really great chili. Uh, Brother Gary did. He, he's had chili coaches. And uh, one, one the, he, he entered his in a weird category. I don't think it was weird, but his sausage had sausage for the base in it, and it was great. Good chili. Um, my strategy was to invite people, and get up, you know, the people you invite get to be judges. So I just tried to have the most people invited so that they would vote for me. And so I won the spicy category. And Brother Tim introduced a different strategy, which is to feed people steak and uh, call it chili. So next year I'm entering the weird category. I'm going to bring my best barbecue ribs. And I'm going to put them in the weird category. And uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, you, you just just get some really good uh, sirloin. What was that in your chuck? Chuck. Yeah. All right, so just chuck steak. Man, it was good. Yeah, yeah that, it was it was really delicious. Just you know, I, I I googled a little bit this last week, just researching chili, and you know, it's a pretty loose term. Charlie defines it very loosely, uh, <laughs> more loosely uh, than anyone else, perhaps. I don't think there's anything chili about Charlie's chili at all. But that's why we have the Charlie category. We call it weird. Uh, <laughs> it was probably good, but uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure why he thinks it's chili. That's the part that's confusing. But you know, chili is is pepper. That's like what chili means. And so, just about any kind of pepper can be called chili. And they just have all kinds of chili peppers. So you put a pepper on something, and you can call it chili. So I'm going to do that next year. I'm going to bring some killer ribs and that'll be my I'm gonna take Tim's strategy away you'll lose next year brother because I'm taking your strategy <laughs> but it was great hey thank you guys for participating really was an excellent forum for somebody to come to, to the church and in a way that maybe they wouldn't have normally come to a church service but it's still expecting to hear something and uh, hearing a message and so forth it was just a great environment for that and uh, I think there are a lot of people that will ultimately be back because of that activity last night. I think there are people that ultimately uh, will come to know Jesus as their Savior as a result of it as well. So just wanted to thank you. You know, you folks invested so much with Melissa and her injuries. She, you know, she does all the work around here. Anybody that watches knows that. And when she wasn't able to work yesterday, everybody else just stepped up. You ladies did a fantastic job decorating and making posters and signs and preparing things. And great job fit and put things away as well. Thank you guys for that. It was, it was a great time. That has nothing to do with the message, so let's try to get our minds right back to where we we're going to. If you're in John chapter 3, will you please look down with me? Please look down with me to verse 27, and we'll read through verse 29 for our text this morning. And uh, be ready to be in, in Matthew and Luke this morning as well. Ready? You find it? Here we go. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Sermon in itself there, isn't there? Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. <clears throat> he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Let's read verse 30 as well. He must increase, but I must decrease. Father, please help us this morning to be able to understand what it is about this individual that you said was the greatest man who lived on earth. And so I pray that we would just look for the source and for the truth of it to the authority of your word this morning and be convinced about some truths that would impact our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into our text this morning, let's just pick up a little bit of our context. We have been preaching in the Gospel of John, really beginning of this year, and there are a few things about the Gospel of John that are important for us to wrap our minds around in order to 
uh, understand, first of all, why it was written. And not only understand why it was written, but to understand how to interpret it. You know, people interpret things all the time, don't they? You ever have somebody say something to you, maybe you're discussing Bible, or even discussing something else, and they say, well, that's how you interpret it, right? Or that's not how I interpret it. I'm always reminded when we use the word interpret in regard to the Scripture of what Peter said in 2 Peter. He said, uh, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is given er, is of any private interpretation. And so whenever somebody says, well, this is how I interpret it, or this is how you interpret it, now maybe an accurate statement. It may be that you're interpreting it as written. But when you have a variety in inter interpretations, can I say to you that's not God's that's not God's intention. The Scripture is written to be understood. And an honest person understands things without their private interpretation. There's no private interpretation in the Bible. That's what we're told about the Scripture. Isn't it incredible, then, that we have denominations? Isn't it incredible that we have denominations? <coughs> Why do we have denominations? Because of private interpretation, right? Uh, because people say, well, this is how I interpret it. You will interpret things through the basis of the attitude that you have toward God's Word. In other words, if your attitude is whatever the Bible says is what God says, and whatever God says becomes what I believe. Do you know, you say, Pastor, but honest people can't... No, 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 no. <laughs> Dishonest people. See, if you have a predisposition to believe something and you're unwilling to receive what God has said, you'll have an interpretation. But it'll be a private interpretation. Honest but, people yeah. with open minds go to the Word of God and draw the same conclusions. doesn't mean you'll know everything or you'll have thought through everything. You realize, have you come to the realization yet that there are things, there are whole uh, bodies of uh, knowledge that have not occurred to you yet? There are entire departments of learning that you just don't have enough life to live? If you haven't realized that yet, do this. Sometime go to the library and try to read every book. And then just add up how many libraries are in the world and then how much knowledge isn't in the library. And you'll realize that there's a lot to learn. So there could be things that I don't know or that I'm wrong about because I haven't sought God's mind on it. Or because I've just thought what I've always thought or believe what I've always believed, but I haven't put the time to search the Scripture. But all things being equal, if I search the Scripture and you search the Scripture, looking for what God thinks about something, do you know we'll come to the same conclusion? You say, Pastor, what if some people aren't smart enough? You know, that has nothing to do with it, actually. I believe that honesty has a lot more to do with your conclusions you draw in the Scripture than whatever your IQ is. There are some very intelligent people who are very wrong about common sense things. Aren't there? There are very intelligent people who are very wrong about common sense things. And just because you disagree with them and they have a higher IQ than you have does not make them right. It's because we are opinionated individuals and we need to, as believers, just remind ourselves continuously how opinionated we actually are. And then be open-minded when we go to the Word of God so that we can learn some practical truths. Amen. And so, one of the things that's helpful when we study the Gospel of John is understanding that it's not a synoptic gospel. A synoptic is sort of a summary or a... Uh, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic in the sense that they cover the same material about Jesus. And... Uh, the gospel being defined, if you, if you just look at what the gospel is, we could simply just use one word to define the gospel. We could say the gospel is Jesus. We know gospel means what? What's the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news, right? And uh, when the gospel writers are used by the Holy Spirit to pen the gospels, what is the object of their good news? Jesus. So Jesus is the gospel. Now, where a lot of Christians get off, though, is that we uh, oftentimes define the process for salvation. Probably the process for salvation is not the right 
term for it. Salvation is a process. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, it's just that simple. But when we talk about the gospel, oftentimes we make it to be the method or the means to be saved. I remember years of my life just wading through, in my mind, seeming contradictions between how the gospel is presented by different people. You ever just read a gospel tract sometime, and at the end of the tract there's a prayer of what you have to do in order to be saved? And then you read a different one, and there's a different prayer about what you have to do in order to be saved? And there are words included or words omitted in different gospels about how to be saved? You ever ask the question, well, how can it be that I've got to pray this to be saved, or I've got to pray this to be saved, but neither guy has the same thing in how they present the gospel. That ever make you wonder about the gospel? If, if you're a thinking person, you may come to the conclusion that the gospel is really complicated because different people don't agree about how to receive it. But friend, that isn't the way it's presented at all. See, the gospel is Jesus, right? If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke you will see Jesus presented as an individual, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are not telling you how to receive Jesus. They're telling you who Jesus is. Jesus is the gospel. John tells you how to be saved. And that's the difference between the gospel of John. You don't believe me? Let's go to the conclusion of, of the gospel of John real quickly. We're still in an introduction this morning, but let's go to, to right to the end of this gospel, to chapter 20, and uh, look at verse 30. <clears throat> Verse 30, John's writing a purpose statement about why he wrote the, the Gospel of John. In verse 30, he said, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, here's this, the that. You know what that means? It means this is why, the purpose. That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. What is John's purpose? express stated purpose in writing this gospel so that you can believe in Jesus and that by believing you can have life in his name right so we could say John's gospel is can we use the word salvific I think that's actually a word because enough people have repeated it that, that it has a degree of validity but the gospel of John shows you how to be saved Matthew's gospel is primarily about Jesus Christ being the King of the Jews and a large volume of material in Matthew's Gospel explains the requirements for a disciple. Well, a disciple, being a disciple is not the requirements for salvation, is it? But isn't discipleship a part of following Jesus? It absolutely is. But don't confuse things that are simply clarified in the Scripture. And by the way, just because brilliant minds preach a gospel that is different than the gospel we find in John chapter 3 where Jesus explains how to be saved. Understand where people are deviating or where they're making a mistake. They're making a mistake in taking requirements oftentimes for discipleship and making them the way that a person receives Jesus as their Savior. When Jesus gave the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, were the disciples believers yet? Well, we know about Judas. God knew about Judas, right? But were the disciples believers when Jesus, when they sat before Jesus and he taught his disciples? Were they believers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the yes. Yes, they were. Okay, so was Jesus telling them how to be saved or how to be disciples? He's teaching them how to be disciples. Well, y'all looking at me like, well, Pastor, oh. I'm glad you're not willing to commit yourselves. At least you're, I hope you're thinking, but y'all look like, mm. okay, those faces I'm getting today, I, you know what, that's probably how you look. That's probably all it is. I'm sorry, that was an insult. John 21, John 21 as well. This is uh, verse 25 I want to read. There are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could, could, not, could not contain the books that should be written. And again, what is the purpose of the Gospel of John? Why was it written? So that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing ye might have life through his name. Why did Jesus do miracles? To impress people? Why did Jesus heal people? Because they needed it? 
You could say in part Jesus had compassion oftentimes, but Jesus did miracles to prove that he was God. That's why he did miracles. That's what the Bible says. And he proved that he was God so that you could believe. We're not in that passage today. We'll go back to John 3 next week. But we see Jesus, when Jesus had Nicodemus come to him by night, what was Nicodemus' classic statement? We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. Jesus did miracles so we could believe that he's God. Belief is described in John 3. By the way, if you have lost friends, if you have friends that don't have, that, that either don't know if they're saved, or uh, don't, they just don't know if they have eternal life, next Sunday morning will be a great time to bring them to church. Be a great time because the gospel simplified the way Jesus taught it is what we're going to be preaching. We're going to preach John 3 next week. We've been looking at the ministry of John the Baptist two weeks ago. Last week we had a little interruption with the evangelists that were here last week. But two weeks ago we saw one of the reasons why Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest man who ever lived. I don't know about you, but when I'm told this is the greatest person that ever lived, I want to find out what they did that was so great. Don't you? That has always piqued my interest. Anytime I'm reading through Matthew and I read Jesus' statement about John the Baptist, that's been a pausing point for me. I cannot make it through the passage without stopping and saying, what a statement. What an incredible thing for God to say about a man. It just gets me. And you know, when I look at John the Baptist, I think, whatever made him great, I want the same thing for me. It's not wrong, Christian, to desire to be great. It's wrong to want to have... Uh, to have respect of men's persons or want men to respect your person. But it's not wrong to want to achieve something that's worthwhile in life, and that's what greatness is. Being what God wants you to be. And so I asked the question, what made John the Baptist so great? Last week we saw that John the Baptist had the ability or understood how to decrease. And most of us don't think of greatness as decreasing. The greatest, hear me now, the greatest thing that you and I could do in our life is to achieve God's purpose. Now that's a simple statement at face value, but there's a lot to it, isn't there? The greatest thing you or I could do in life would be to achieve God's purpose. Has it ever occurred to you that God made you for a reason and express purpose? You know, I remember training for the ministry and hearing a statement which is not altogether true and just buying into it. And as I've evaluated it in the scripture, I've realized it isn't true. The statement was this. Everyone is replaceable. You ever heard that statement? Everyone is replaceable. Now, is it true that if you won't do what God wants, that God's not going to wring his hands and just be helpless in heaven? Well, that's true, isn't it? But you know... At whole value, what that statement means is nobody matters. Right? I mean, that state, you know, have you ever been at, to a business where they acted as though nobody mattered? And just, just churned through employees? It's the worst, most hostile job environment you could have. You could be a great worker, but if, well, you know, you're, everybody's replaceable is the attitude there. It's a hostile work environment, isn't it? You know, God's not like that. God doesn't make you, form you, equip you, save you, call you, and then just kick you aside and use someone else because you don't matter. God made you expressly, uniquely, for the purpose of glorifying Himself, and there is a place, and there is a way, there's a means for you to do that, and it matters. And there's no one that can step in your place if you're not who God wants you to be. And to help you to know that, you are not replaceable. There are individuals in your life, uh, Paul put it this way in the church, uh, when he wrote the letter to the church in Rome, Rome, he said, no man liveth unto himself. In other words, the people you rub shoulders with are people that you are uniquely equipped to impact their lives. And no one else can do it. You know, as we've been doing our soul winning saturation training, that has been the crux of what we've been trying to teach people. And that is that God puts you in a place where you can reach people no one else can. Hey, the visitors we had last night, no one but the people that brought them could have gotten them here. That's just a fact. I, could, I didn't even know most of the people that you invited. 
And you didn't know the people I invited. No one else could have gotten them here last night but the people who invited them because God made you for that purpose. Listen, no one else can raise your children. No one else can be your spouse. No one else can be your son or your daughter or your uh, mother. You, you can't be a, a mother or father. They're, they're, you're not replaceable. God made you for an express purpose, and you must be who God wants you to be. And as I look at, let's get back to the Scripture now, as I look at John the Baptist in his ministry, he was created for a real purpose. You ever just thought about the preparation of John the Baptist's life and then the scope of time in which he effectively ministered? And the guy had about a couple years, maybe about six months to a year of solid life impact. He was created for that time when he was going to preach the message, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. How long, how long did, was that the message to be preached? If he preached it too early when Jesus was a youth, would that, have, would that have accomplished God's purpose? I mean, it was just like right before Jesus comes onto the scene, John the Baptist comes on the scene, and his whole life's purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord to make straight his paths. You ever just examine somebody's life and realize they were created for a moment? Uh, I don't know if you're a history buffer, but sometimes study, study great presidents or great world leaders. Winston Churchill, for instance, would not have been the man that he was, would not have had the world view that he had, had he not come onto the scene at the time that he did. And it's interesting, after World War II was over, pretty much Winston Churchill was over. It was just like, he just had this, he, the world view he had before World War II was world's different than what he saw and the way he responded at that time. And he was literally created for just a couple of years. I literally believe that God used a man in a way that's undeniably impacted the world. And it was just a snapshot in time. You know, Ronald Reagan was a pretty great president. I've said a lot of times that in retrospect, Reagan was a great president, but I wouldn't have probably even wanted to vote for him the first time he ran for office in California. He just didn't have the history behind it, but he was shaped in many ways, wasn't he? By communism, by the time frame in which he came, and by the, the turn of events in the United States. He was used just to, you know, really had an impactful eight years of his life. But that was it. I don't care if you agree with me about Ronald Reagan or not. I'm not getting political here. I don't care if you like Churchill or not. That's not the point. What I'm saying is is that God made you for a purpose. And for John the Baptist, I mean, we're talking about months of his life that impacted the world, even today. And Jesus said because of that time that he was used, he was the greatest man to ever live. And two weeks ago, we saw that John the Baptist was a master of decreasing. One of the things that made John the Baptist great was when his disciples came to him and said, you know the one you baptized uh, beyond Jordan? He's making more disciples than you are. And John the Baptist's response was, servant's not greater than his master or disciple is Lord. You know, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom rejoices when the bridegroom has his bride. He says, I told you, didn't I tell you? I'm not the one that comes. I came before him, but the one that comes after me is greater than me. I told you that. And then he made the profound statement, he must increase, I must decrease. And he was precisely correct. Because Jesus was God, John the Baptist is a man. And for John the Baptist to be great, and for Jesus to not be as great, would have supplanted God. You know, most of us just, we just can't decrease. When I look at, what, at the demise of John the Baptist, I'm dismayed. I think, what a good man. Got his head lopped off because he told Herod the truth. He was beheaded at a whim of some silly teeny bopper that decided that uh, she was going to listen to her mom and make an unreasonable request. It was tragic how John the Baptist died, but not actually. Because John the Baptist fulfilled his purpose in life, and the greatest thing he ever did was disappearing. Think on that. The greatest preacher, the greatest prophet that ever lived, the greatest thing he did was vanishing. Going from being absolutely known 
everywhere, recognized everywhere, to gone. Now, friend, let me ask you a practical question. Do you know how to decrease? Do you know how to decrease? Do you know how to lift up Jesus and disappear yourself? Most of us don't, do we? You know, I don't know how many times in ministry I run across individuals who have the desire to increase. You know, there are just little things that people say that, uh, you know, kind of trigger, you know, a thought in my mind. You know, you know, I really should be in a position of more prominence. And there are a lot of ways people say it. I've had people just, just flat out state it. You know what? You know, I'm better qualified than that person. I should be in that position. And they, they literally want a position or a title. There are men who are in ministry that are more concerned with the position and the title than they are with the job. And minister is a word for servant. You don't notice servants. But there are individuals who, you know what, nobody notices anything I do. Maybe you've done it well, but you've gotten off somewhere because you don't know how to decrease. You have the praise of men, you don't have the praise of God. Okay, so now would you go with me to Matthew? Now, uh, Matthew, and we'll go to chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> Look at a second perspective about why John the Baptist uh, was great. <clears throat> he was great because of his ability to decrease, but he was also great because of his ability to point people to Jesus. Are you in chapter 11? It came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor of the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whoever, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Well, it's a pretty good summary of Jesus' miracles, isn't it? If you want to just summarize the miracles of Jesus, what are the things Jesus did that proved he was God, this summary is there. How many of you have heard great messages preached about doubt from John the Baptist sending, uh, his, sending his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one that should come, or do we look for another? How many of you have heard great messages about doubt? Right? Uh, you know, today we could preach the message. I don't, the, the scripture doesn't say this. It doesn't say John the Baptist doubted. But the script, today we could preach the message that John the Baptist was a great example of a great person because of his example in doubt. I've heard that message. I've heard people say, well, you know, John the Baptist, even after he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and I have need to be baptized of thee, and he recognized who Jesus was, even though when he was a babe in the womb, he leapt for joy when the mother of Jesus came into the room. Even though John knew all those things, yet he had his season of doubt. And so he's very relatable to us because we all go through seasons of doubt. You heard that message? I have many times. But you know what the, where the Bible says that John the Baptist doubted? Well, let's read the text again. Let's look at it. Okay? Uh, verse 2, When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent his to his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. Uh, do, you, do you see the doubt there? Do you see John the Baptist doubted? Now, the Holy Spirit does know the word doubt, just to help you with something. When Thomas doubted, the Holy Spirit knew that word. Sometimes I'm a little sarcastic when I say things, but you know, if God wanted us to think that John the Baptist doubted, don't you think the Bible could expressly state it? In other words, when we read the text, we read our thoughts or our feelings or our emotions into it, and so we read John doubted. I'm not criticizing or attacking anybody's message on that, but I will point it out to you, the Bible doesn't say John the Baptist doubted. Could we at least agree on that? When I see something like this that causes me to question and say, well, what was John asking? That's a good time to learn some things. It's a good time to learn some things. And so I'd like to ask just a practical question as I reflected on it. Here's a question I asked. Where was John at when he asked the question? 
Prison. Now, prison was a dark time for John. Well, can we agree on that? <laughs> yes, it was. I don't think probably anybody, well, whenever you make a 100% statement, uh, it's, it's not necessarily completely true, but I don't think most people enjoy prison. Can we put it that way? I don't think prison is a, it can be, it can, it can result in God getting your attention. I know a lot of people, their testimony is, God got my attention when I was in prison. I was in jail, or I was in prison, or whatever, but that's where I really uh, met God. So prison can be a place of enlightenment, couldn't it? But the reality of it is that prison for John was a dark place. But I don't believe that the scripture says it was a place of doubt. Well, let's ask the question then, what was John asking? He said, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now let me ask you a question. When John baptized Jesus, was he fairly confident that he was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world? Sure. Yes. Right? He knew who Jesus was when he baptized him. And it helped that a voice spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That helped. <laughs> right? So, did John baptize the right individual? Yes. So, is John saying, did I baptize the wrong guy? No. 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 But you know, there have always been false Christs. I'm not saying John baptized a false Christ. What I'm saying, there are a lot of people that have claimed to be Jesus. In every generation. And anyone can baptize someone. There, if you are... If you have time to waste some time and you'd like to amuse yourself, sometime look into Jesus figures. There are people who think they're Jesus today. And to me, there's, it, it's tragic, but there's some comedy in it. And I guess the tragic aspect of it is that people follow them. Because Jesus is who he is. Anyone who claims to be Jesus obviously isn't Jesus. And it's incredible how they interpret themselves as Jesus. But let me ask you a question. Were there false Christs? in the day of Jesus. You remember Gamaliel when the Peter and John were brought before the same council that crucified Jesus? If you ever read Acts sometime, it's fascinating Gamaliel's take. Remember he talked about Thutis and Justice? He talked about a, a, a guy by the name of Judas that got a following after him and he said, you know, he came on the scene and a lot of people followed him and then poof, you know, he was gone and everything kind of just just disappeared afterward. And he said, you know, if, if Jesus isn't God, then just let them do what they're doing and it'll go away. But he said, if this be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. That's what Gamaliel said. That's pretty good, pretty intelligent take on it, wasn't it? You know what John is asking is, are you the one that I baptized over Jordan? That's all he's asking. Are you the one that I baptized? There are false Christ in the day of Christ. Many false Christ in the day of Christ. Study Hanukkah sometime. Study Hanukkah. Now, mm -hmm. the Maccabees were not claiming to be Jesus, but the Jews take the miracle of Hanukkah, quote, to prove that God was working in illegitimate Judaism at the time in order to validate their religion. In other words, if you study intertestamental history, you'll see about 400 years where God had said, I won't speak to you again until Jesus is born. That was the prophecy of the scripture. It was the last word from God. And so the Jews needed some miracles. So they had the miracle of the, of the oil, that, you know, the candle that did burn out. And that proved that God was still working in Israel, even though he'd said, I'm not speaking, I'm not working through Israel. Now, I'm not picking that. I just study it sometime. Ask the question for yourself. There are a lot of individuals who claim to be messianic or to do miracles or to be Christ. And they're false teachers. So John said, are you the one? You're the guy that I baptized? Is it Jesus? How could he know who Jesus was when he wasn't there to see? He could not witness the miracles Jesus was doing, and so he sent his disciples to ask the question. What happened when, when uh, John's disciples saw Jesus? What happened to him? They left John and began following me. If you're going to send your disciples after somebody, you better make sure they're the right one. And there were a lot of Messianic Christ figures in Jesus' day, many more than there are today. And I believe that's a simple explanation for what John is asking here. But the question John asked 
And what his response to Jesus' answer, that's the teaching that's in the Scripture. You know, it doesn't matter how you want to... Well, it does matter. You, you interpret the Scripture your own way. You're going to come up with the wrong conclusions. You come up with the wrong conclusions, you'll miss the point of the Scripture. And the point is right here. Look at uh, verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do <coughs> Excuse me. hear and see. What? The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor of the gospel preached to them. Tell John what I do. Now, why did Jesus want John's disciples to, to tell him what he did? Come on, it, it, it is not a, this is not a, a trick question, okay? I'm not trying to trick you. Why did Jesus tell John's disciples to tell what he did? To encourage John and to strengthen his disciples. Okay, encourage and strengthen him. Of the prophecy about him. So that so he would John sure. wouldn't what? So he'd know for sure. So he'd know for sure Jesus is God. That he's not a false Christ, he's not an imitation Christ, but that he's actually the Christ. Now here we're not talking about in contrast, or here we're not talking about, you know, that he's you didn't think wrongly about me. We're talking about the false Christ compared to the true Christ. Who else can raise the dead? Who else can heal the lame? Who else can heal the deaf? Who else can heal the deaf lepers? Who else can save the poor? Only Jesus can. And I believe that another reason that John the Baptist is a great man was he not only had the ability to recognize who Jesus was, but he had the ability to point people to Jesus. He had the ability not only to decrease but he had the ability to recognize who Jesus was and direct others to the same Jesus. What was John's, John's message initially? Repent. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what was his message when Jesus came to him? Behold the Lamb, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And now that John's locked up in prison and he can't follow Jesus himself, what's his message? Follow Jesus. Follow the right person. How do, I, how do we know Jesus is the right person? How do we know Jesus is God? That's miracles. Because of miracles he did. You know, John wasn't willing just to follow anybody or accept anybody or anything. John was a great man because he'd accept nothing but Jesus. You know, a lot of people are looking for a fit. <clears throat> They're looking for a fit, aren't they? I'm trying to find a church where I fit. Isn't that what most people do? I'm trying to find a religion. You're not religious, but you, you, you're, you're, you've got a desire, a spiritual desire. You try to find a religion that fits you. I don't know how many... Uh, <laughs> Church slogans or, or uh, introductions say, you know, find a place where you fit. You know what I love about our church? Everything. Love everything about our church. Right? You know what I love about our church? It's how different we are from each other. The truth is, is that if we didn't know Jesus as our Savior, we'd probably never know one another. We're just that different. Uh, not so much this morning because there's a lot of folks missing, but normally we're pretty diverse. I mean, we're just, just from everywhere and different backgrounds, and we're just a bunch of different people who would never fit together. But what brings us together is Jesus. We're chilly. We're chilly. <laughs> Charlie. No, it's Jesus, right? It's Jesus. You know, because truth... Truth is the same for everybody from every background. You're, you're, you're different. Now, truth isn't different, but you're different than anyone else you've ever met, aren't you? I know you don't like to admit it. Everybody wants to feel like they're the same as everybody else, but you're weird. I don't care. But, no, but you're different than anyone else. No, There's no one like you. The mold was broken when you were born. And in life, generally speaking, don't we assemble ourselves or accumulate around common interest? Athletes with athletes, artists with artists, nerds with nerds, 
uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sportsmen with sportsmen. We, we just kind of just, don't we just tend to just group up on the basis of similarities? But you know a good church isn't that way. A good church is dissimilar individuals grouped around the only true and living God. The only one. And so John the Baptist, the message to him by Jesus was, go tell, go tell John what I'm doing. You think Jesus promotes doubt? Well, John, I'm, you know, sorry to hear you're doubting, but uh, everybody does, even Thomas will. And uh, so, no. No, Jesus said, good question, John, here's the answer. You know, God never, God never, you ever had somebody say, don't question God? Did the Bible ever say, never question God? You know, I think we need to question, don't we? You know, I found about questions is, is God answers them. That's what I found out about God. And I've had people say, you know, never question God. Never challenge God. Never accuse God. You can put it that way, couldn't you? Never accuse God. You'll never be, you'll never accuse God and be in the right. Whenever you say, God, how could you be good and send people to hell? Well, you're saying you're good and you're saying God isn't because God isn't what your expectation of good is. You're the one that's not good. God's fine. Well, God, if you're good, then why don't you do something about evil? Friend, <laughs> in more ways than one, God has dealt with and is dealing with evil. And a person who'd say God should do something about evil is a person that says, I'm good. I don't, you know, you want someone else to be judged, not you, when you want God to do something about evil. You never accuse God. But friend, God, what are you doing? I'd like to know. I'm willing to wait for your time in it. But do you know that knowing what God's doing might be a help? It's not a bad thing to say, God, I'd like to see your hand in this. You know, oftentimes when I pray with individuals, I do continually. Most weeks, I, I'm, I'm with somebody at a bedside or with somebody at a home or meeting somewhere with somebody who's going through something terrible in their lives. And one of the things we pray is, God, help us to know what you're doing. Help us to see it because as soon as possible, we want to get with your plan. We look forward to the time when we're able to testify of what God has done because of what we're going through right now. You'll never go through a difficult time, and you will. You'll never go through a difficult time that God doesn't have a plan and God's doing something. God's working. You don't accuse God. You ask God. And John the Baptist is in prison, and he's saying, you know, if I could follow him around, I'd make sure it's the right guy, but I don't know. And Jesus said, well, here's what I'm doing. Is that good enough for you? John says, yeah. <laughs> okay, you got it handled. And John was able to transfer his followers, his disciples, and say, follow him. Follow him. Not only did John the Baptist, not only was he great because he understood how to decrease, but he understood to help Jesus increase by saying, who are you? Yes, you're the one. Follow Him. Follow Him. For the greatest thing you could ever do in life is point people to Jesus. You don't have to worry about Jesus' validity. There will be no one who uh, goes and says, you know, I'm going to disprove the existence of Jesus Christ. Who will ever be able to do it? They'll prove the existence of Jesus Christ. There will be no one that says, you know what, I'm going to disprove the resurrection. Who will ever be able to do it? If they're open-minded and honest, they'll become believers in the resurrection. You cannot test God and find Him wanting or failing. And John the Baptist had the ability to say, test Him. Go ahead and look to Him. Find out. Because you'll find out that He's true. And that what His Word says is true. He understood how to increase Jesus while He Himself decreased. You know, as a believer, you and I could practically learn that in a lot of ways. We could exercise that in many ways. There have been many times I'd have to say, you know, I, yeah, you're right, I'm not a good representation for Jesus. He's much better than I am. Look to Jesus. No, you could see my faults and failures, but you won't find me with Jesus. Look at Jesus. 
And the ability just to say, Behold, the Lamb of God. Not, well, you know, I try really hard, and so it's been some years, but I've finally gotten to the place where I am because, you know, I just met the humble Christian bragger. <laughs> you succeed in your purpose in life, my friend. Not only will you decrease, but you'll get out of the way and point people to Jesus. John was satisfied with Jesus' answer. You never hear another word from John the Baptist after this. You don't hear him come back and say, are you really, really the one? Are you sure? No. He said, I just want to make sure you're the right one. And when he knew, last word. That's it. His ministry is done. Next thing, you know, can I hurry up, put my head on the platter. I'm out of here. <laughs> And that sounds morbid and, and so forth than it was, but the reality of it is is that John lived the greatest life any man's ever lived. He never did a miracle. Never performed a miracle, ever. He was never impressive in his person. He looked like a redneck in the woods, except he was in the wilderness. Nobody said, you know, John the Baptist is what I want to be like. Be like John. Nobody ever said that. Matter of fact, when you think of the miracles Jesus did, Jesus offered, Jesus asked the Pharisees, why'd you come out in the wilderness? What'd you come out to see? Greatest, greater man never lived. And John the Baptist was great because he decreased and because he had the ability to point people to Jesus so that Christ could increase. Meditate on that. Would you let God just take that truth and allow it to run through you. Don't relate to John the Baptist because you doubt. <coughs> relate to John the Baptist because you know how to decrease and you know how to point people to Jesus. Father, thank you for what we've learned today from your word. And that, God, although it's incredibly simple and straightforward, that's what we need. We need simple, straightforward truth. Lord, I pray that you would help every one of us. In every one of us, there's a desire oftentimes to not only have preeminence, but to be somebody or something or to be recognized. We recognize that the greatest man who ever lived didn't have that. And in order for us to achieve greatness, people need to see a great Jesus. And if they think <coughs> that I'm great, they'll never think Jesus is as much as He actually is. So I pray that you would help us to learn how to point people to Jesus. God, I ask you to bless and move in our invitation this morning in Jesus' name. We're going to have an invitation this morning. It's pretty simple, and I'm not trying to get everybody to move or to do something. But I'd like you to consider the Word of God and just allow it to impact you. I've said many times, and I think it's very, very true, that if God's spoken to you or if God showed you something, God doesn't just give you knowledge so you can say, well, add that to the category of things I know. God gives you knowledge so that you can live and apply the things that you know. And sometimes when God speaks to you, you need to respond. Sometimes you need to respond by saying, no, God. No, you never need to respond that way. Sometimes you need to respond by just saying yes. And that's really the invitation this morning. Now, if you're here, if you're here this morning and you would say, you know, Pastor, you talked a lot about uh, the gospel being Jesus and you talked some about being saved. But when it comes to the matter of eternal life, I'm not sure that that's something that I have settled. <clears throat> well, if that's you here this morning, uh, before you leave this place, the Word of God is so clear and so simple about the matter of eternal life that you could have it simply by recognizing who Jesus is and that He died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, and that believing in what Jesus did, putting your faith and trust in Him, you could be saved by receiving Him. If you've never done that, you're not saved. But you can be saved by simply asking. I got saved as a child by saying, God, I want to be saved because of what Jesus did for me. And it's, it's really that simple. You could, of course, you, you, the, the words of your heart, however they're phrased, by receiving Jesus as your Savior, you'd be born again and have eternal life. If you're not saved this morning, that's for you. If you're here this morning, though, and I think most of us would fit in the category of people who've received Jesus. You know, I think all of us as believers struggle with the greatness that John the Baptist achieved. It's not natural in us to want to decrease. It's not natural in us 
even to want Jesus to decrease. Sometimes we want the glory that belongs only to God. Maybe God's showing you today, you know, I need to point people more to Jesus and get out of the way. I need to diminish and I need to increase who Jesus is. If God showed you that, would you just, just let God just say yes, Lord, in the invitation? If you're physically able to, I'm going to ask everyone to stand to their feet and turn to page 246 in your hymn books. It's a blue book. If you know the song, you can sing along. But if God's spoken to you and you need to just say yes to something that God has said to you, while others are singing, just pause for a moment and just say and just tell God what's on your heart. Tell Him what He's shown you and spoken to you because we would be remiss if we left this place today without responding to the message that God's spoken to us. Page 246, softly and tenderly. As we sing, you just do business with the Lord. We're going to sing the first, third, and fourth verse. Oh, we have no pianist. I didn't realize that. <laughs> I didn't even look over there. We usually have an invisible pianist. Let's just sing it. And as we sing, you respond as God's spoken to you. Softly and